the first thing we're going to talk about is defamation. And if you're in journalism classes, you've heard about libel, you've heard about slander. Both of those terms are covered under this concept of defamation. So libel is injury to reputation, usually in print. <coughs> slander is injury to reputation, usually verbally communicated. So a lot of times people throw around these terms, but they're misusing them. So just understand there is a difference, but I'm just going to talk to you about what defamation in general means, whether that was in writing or whether it was verbal, because you have to understand what your public communication on behalf of an organization can mean legally, because you are legally responsible as a PR professional. So we're going to talk about defamation. Defamation is a false statement communicated to others through print, broadcast, or electronic means. Now you can see there it covers libel and slander. It covers something verbally communicated or something written. And it has to be false. You can't say, well, you told something I didn't want people to know. You defamed me. It's still true. So defamation has to be false. And the person was identified or is identifiable. If no one knows who you are talking about, it's really hard to show damage to reputation, right? So how does it damage a reputation if they don't know who you are? So you have made a false statement, and you identify the person, and there's actual injury in terms of money, reputation, or mental suffering. Now those can be tricky. That's why you want to take the PR media law class here on campus to learn more about this. But there was an instance of a crisis PR person who was working with a major organization they were getting sued, and the person wanted to sue because of emotional distress that had happened through this experience. You could see something similar with any number of PR crises. But this particular PR case was interesting, because not only did the person who was harmed want to sue, his wife also wanted to sue. And she was suing, saying that it was mental suffering because it disrupted their marriage, because he was so distraught. So she was going to sue, and he was going to sue. The person making the statement is malicious or negligent. So when you're going after defamation, you're saying, I either really wanted to harm you, or I just didn't do my job. We posted something wrong, it identified you, you've been harmed, and it's my fault because I didn't check the facts. But there are ways to avoid this. There are ways to cover your basis. One is accompanying statements that are opinion, <coughs> pardon me, with a statement. You've probably seen that at the beginning of infomercials, at the beginning of interviews. There's a statement that says, all the views expressed herein are not the views of the company. They are the sole views of the person being interviewed. That's because they don't want to be sued for defamation. They're saying this is their opinion, not our company statement. You clearly label opinions. You also have things reviewed by legal. If you're going to put out a statement, make sure your legal team has looked at it. Also, don't say anything that's not true that identifies a person that's going to harm them. That really helps you kind of cover your basis. So this is a big area of PR. It's something you want to be careful with. And it's largely because you need to understand that when you're in the context of communication, you're dealing with companies that regularly are in the public eye. And your communication has a direct impact on that company and on the public. Both of those are influenced. So you need to know corporations, those you are representing, are public figures. You cannot represent an organization and have them viewed as a private individual. When you're dealing with the law, private individuals have certain rights. Public groups have different kinds of rights, different kinds of rules they have to live by. So you can't say, well, that's a privacy thing, unless you know the difference between privacy at an organizational level and as an individual level. Fair comment privilege, the right to an opinion. So companies that have wares available to the public have no real recourse against criticism done with honest purpose and lack of malicious intent. So sometimes there's examples given in your reading where a boss or a manager comes to the PR person and there's been some sort of op-ed piece or news article and the person's saying things like, this hotel chain is a really poor hotel chain. I would not recommend staying there. I had bad service, something along that line. Because of reviews, things happen. There have been Broadway plays that stop having people buy tickets because of a bad critique. There have been hotels that have downturns. So if someone comes to you and says, this was written, we want to sue them for defamation, you have to understand that you have something publicly available. 
people are allowed to have an opinion on your publicly available service. They're allowed to have an opinion on whether or not they like your hotel, your Broadway play, your musical. They didn't write something that was false. It was their opinion. It may have been negative, but it was still true. And if it impacted you, that's simply something that's covered under fair comment because they are a public figure, not private. You also have to be very aware internally of your employees because in PR we love to share stories, we love to get out there and highlight employees, things they're doing, but you have to understand that there's privacy because your employees are private citizens and your organization is a public figure. So employee communications, you need to think about do you have the right, have you gotten permission from an employee to share specific details in something like a company newsletter. I worked for one company and they sent out newsletters every month and had an employee felt uncomfortable, it might have been an issue because there were no waivers ever signed, no permission gained to highlight that person within this newsletter that became a public piece provided to others. You also need photo releases. It's kind of a pain because you're in the process of getting those photos, capturing the moment, finding the perfect thing, but you should follow that up with a release by the people who are covered in that photo. If you plan to use it in a brochure, if you plan to display it in your company, if you plan to put it in a newsletter, put it on a website, share it on social media, you need the rights of the people who are in that photo to give you permission. Product publicity and advertising. This is an interesting one because, for example, let's say Pink's Hot Dog. Anyone eat in there? Okay, a couple of you. I, I really want to. It's so close. I feel like I should, and I actually have a deep love of hot dogs, but I have yet to get there. However, I know a lot of celebrities go there, right? Pink's, however, cannot take a picture of Sandra Bullock when she shows up eating her hot dog and put it in a magazine saying, come to Pink's. Sandra Bullock loves us, so will you. That's misappropriation of identity. That's taking a photo of her while she's a private person. She does have a little difference because she's a celebrity, but she didn't give permission for her identity to be used in conjunction with that advertising. She didn't say, oh yeah, I endorse you. And by taking that photo and using it on product publicity, you've broken the law. Media inquiries about employees. So as a PR person, you may also field calls. Perhaps if you were here at Biola, you would get a call saying, hey, we are the city of Fullerton, and one of the people we're honoring at next week's city council meeting is an employee of yours. I'd love if you could give us some background and information so we can highlight it and share this great news. As a PR person, you need to know what is legally appropriate for you to share and what's considered personal. And that's all outlined in your reading. I'd encourage you to become familiar with it. You can't share certain things like how many children, their address, work performance reviews. You can confirm that they work for you. I think you can confirm their name. But there's another way that people go about this. And again, PR is about just thinking ahead. One thing some companies do is when an employee comes on board, they have them sign a release and check off what they're comfortable having shared. <coughs> so maybe they love their three kids and they don't care that other people are talking about them. That's great. They can be included. So they check the box and say, I give you permission if I become famous person of the year that you can share this. That's a good way to cover your basis as a PR person because you've gotten writing that says even though they're a private citizen, you can use their information in a public setting. You guys kind of tracking with this so far? It's a lot to take in, but it's good to know because we deal with different publics all the time. One of the things I think is most confusing probably as a student is the idea of copyright. You guys get to function under a different kind of copyright than professionals function under. And yet you're doing a lot of professional work and you're about to be launched into an industry that's highly competitive, deals with creative ideas, constantly pitches ideas. So what is copyright? Now copyright does not apply to an idea. I was thinking last night about a great company that I really want to start with my cousin, mainly because she's the brains behind it and I want to get on board with that. But then I realized, you know, if I share that idea with you here today, and one of you thinks it's a great idea, and you launch the company next week, I cannot say you just violated my rights. Because it's only an idea. I haven't done something yet. Now I could put it in writing. I could go to someone and say, here's my business plan. But simply having an idea is not copyrightable. Now preferably you won't 
do that, preferably if I shared something, you wouldn't take off and start it before me. But you've seen cases like this. There's cases of people who say, hey, I had the idea for that novel, and I talked to this person, and then they wrote the book. Now it's a New York Times bestseller. That's my idea. You guys have heard those cases, right? They're claiming, kind of, that their idea was copyrighted. So we realize that a copyright applies to something physical. <coughs> Your reading also covered fair use versus infringement. Fair use is this idea that you can use part of a publication, part of something to share with a group. So for example, you might have a certain section of a newsletter article that you want to share with your employees, and you put that up on a screen during a meeting. That's very different than you saying, wow, this newsletter that I have subscribed to is awesome. I'm going to take it down and photocopy it for all 3,000 employees. That's different. There's a fair use to material that is copyrighted that you're allowed to use, and there is infringement upon a copyright, saying you've broken that. You're not giving proper credit to the people who own that copyright. Photography is a really big area this comes in especially with PR, because a lot of PR people work with photographers to get their photos. And what they don't realize is that freelance photographers own the photography. They own the picture. They can give you a copy, they can give you a CD, but they own the rights to the image unless something has been signed, unless you agreed upon that from the beginning. So there was a case with a really large organization, I believe it was Walmart, and they hired videographers. And the videographers were coming through doing this in-depth story, and they were finding stuff that wasn't really the angle Walmart wanted them to take. But the videographers owned all of the original footage. They could still provide the movie documentary that Walmart wanted, but they still had all of the documentary information to make their own documentary that was not so flattering. Because they did not sign that they gave over the rights to the original. So when you're working with photography, consider, are you working with a freelancer? It's different if you're working with an in-house person. Because when you're in-house, typically everything you create, usually they say this in the employee handbook, is that of the company. So when I was at an agency, what I made at the company, I can't bring with me. I can't just say, well, I did this. It's mine. It's actually the company's. They hired me. I was working for them. And that's what we're talking about with work for hire. Did you contract it out, or is it a person who is part of the organization? That's something you want to keep your eye on. Trademarks and copyrights are different. Trademarks are a word, a symbol, a slogan, like just do it or have it your way. All those things, those are trademarks. And you usually see that little T behind it. In PR, you want to recognize what is a trademark. For example, Kleenex is actually the name of a product, right? So that's copyrighted. Tissue, you can say. So when you're writing press releases, when you're writing brochure copy, when you're writing for the website, you need to know, is this a trademark thing? Is it copyrighted? And then one of the horrible things I had to do, I worked on a website, and I found out we didn't do a computer system to catch all of the copyrights and trademarks. So we had to go in and do coding for every single word that was supposed to be copyrighted or trademarked, because organizations want that protected. It's something important to their brand. And if you don't symbolize that this is a protected thing, how is anyone to know? How are you supposed to know it's copyrighted unless it's followed with the C or the T? Yes? Um, so what, I guess it's more business, but like what would be like an LLC? Limited liability company. Mm -hmm. So that's a type of organization that's formed. So it has more to deal with the entity of the business versus what they create. And it's a type of partnership that gives you legal protection under it. And then for the copyright, how far is it still an idea, like even if it's written down, like one of my friends two years ago was they had drafted out and like written a movie with a screenwriter and they were doing table reads for it while well, someone else ended up like taking it but they couldn't and like they'd made it to a movie but they oh. couldn't had for it or like they couldn't do anything about it because you can go through a formal copyright process. When you have that idea, you can send it into the copyright organization, or you can like, send, people have sent sealed envelopes to lawyers or stuff to keep with a trade uh, postage stamp on it. But it gets very complicated, especially when you get into things in the creative arts. That is something I am less versed in than the intricacies of, especially because it's in the entertainment industry. But mass media law and ethics would definitely answer that one. It's really sad, especially since I made it to the movies. Copyright guidelines. You should make sure your major pieces are copyrighted, particularly if you're using it for an organization. So if you're using a brochure, if you're using a report, 
take the time to get that copyrighted, especially Fortune 500, top level. They pay a lot of money to get that. They don't need it ripped off. Do not use copyrighted materials to advance sales without permission. This is kind of a summary from your section, so I'm hoping it reinforces what you read. Quantity reprints of articles should be ordered from the publisher. So again, newsletter, you loved it. If you want 3,000 copies for all your employees, order it from the publisher. Don't go to the Xerox machine. Permission is required for segments of TVs, movies, songs. So what happens a lot in college that I've noticed, people make great, like, they put music behind pictures that they've created. That actually is an infringement of copyright if you start making money on it. So I worked with an organization, and they did not get permission for the song they wanted to use in a video they were making for a marketing purpose. And YouTube has gotten really sophisticated. They will market and take it down unless you actually have shown how it works. And so this organization spent thousands of dollars getting this video made, only to have it copyright infringement and unable to share with people. <coughs> the philosophy was it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Never go with that in PR. Get permission because you don't want to waste the time and money. Freelancers retain the right to their works. So you need to negotiate the permission or the total rights to those works and the fees beforehand in writing. Celebrity photos cannot be used for permission without permission for promotion. And there's more on page 305, depending on the version of your book. So again, these are things you want to know about. I want to introduce you to the kind of law that you need to be familiar with. You definitely want to take the class because it goes very in depth. Yes? Um, what about on social networking sites? Like, can you, do you have to have permission to use like pictures? Because I know like a lot of people have pictures like that are not their own that are like cover photos and stuff. Is that not okay? That's okay. There's a couple of reasons why. One, you're not using it on behalf of a major organization to make money. Mm -hmm. You are an individual user just sharing it and usually it's not endorsing a product or saying that this person mm -hmm. gave permission. Like people take pictures of celebrities all the time and will post it or pictures mm -hmm. of cover photos and that's okay. Yeah. You wouldn't do it on behalf of Biola and put it on the Biola one and say that there's some sort of connection. Mm -hmm. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. What about a blog? Would that be the same thing? You could take a picture from an organization and put it on your blog. And, but if you cite it, is that okay? If you cite it, that's good. And if you get permission. A lot of times, groups are really willing to negotiate, especially on blog, because then you have the interconnection of links. You can say, we'd really love to share this. We'd love to hyperlink it so people can come back to your site as well. Would you be willing to let us use it? And they're usually great. When I was a student, I was planning an apologetics conference, and I wrote a band. And I said, I really want to use your song behind our materials. It's promotional. Here's the purpose. Would you give me permission? They wrote back within five days and said, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Probably because they knew that I was a student and planning a small thing. But typically, people just appreciate being asked. Other questions? OK. So here is a whole bunch of names that you guys got introduced to in your reading. And depending on the sector you go into, you will be working with different government organizations. I worked a lot with the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. That's because I was in radio. So when new laws came out, for example, we were a nonprofit, so we have certain types of air airwaves. There's ones that are devoted to stations who are nonprofit and stations who are for profit. And I had a lot of clients on nonprofit. If my clients made a call to action for something that was designed to give money that could violate the permissions of the airways for that station. So I had one client who finished his segment with, I like Chick-fil-A, I hope you'll go out and get a burger today or something like that, whatever he said. That was a call to action. And I got a call from the radio station asking me to talk to my client and let him know that that's a violation of their licensing and he would need to stop that or be dropped from the station. So depending, you might be working with the financial sector. You might be working in food, entertainment. There's all sorts of different ones. But whatever sector you get into, you want to become familiar with the laws, the legislation, the way that it works for your organization. And this just, they start shortening it. So it's FTC, SEC, FCC, FDA, ATF. All of those are shortened. People just kind of throw it around like it's strong vernacular or something. So just be familiar. If they start saying it, I was freaked out when I started. I was like, what is the FCC? What does that mean? Google it. You can find out a lot. But also ask someone in your industry, what are the implications for me as a communications person working under this organization? One of the things you want to think about is free speech. 
because that's big in the US, right? People say, well, we're free and we can say what we want. But again, if you're representing an organization, you're on different levels. An organization is a public figure versus private figure. So you have no ability to have the right for free speech under certain circumstances. For example, there's laws against standing up in a crowded movie theater and screaming fire when there's no fire, right? That's endangering, it's false, it creates havoc. The same kind of principles apply to organizations. And it's especially important in PR because we're influencing values, opinions, beliefs, behaviors. And if we are out there promoting false statements, that's harmful to the public. There are laws against it, as well as misleading or deceptive. So you don't make promises such as, we created the cure to cancer, come take this vitamin and you'll be healthy. That's false, misleading, deceptive, right? And you see all sorts of gimmicks that kind of touch as far as they can to the line, but they don't cross it. So you want to think when you write a press release, am I misleading anyone? Am I even over-promising what this could be providing? You also can't promote unlawful goods and services. No one has the right to free speech to promote human sex trafficking on the airwaves. That's just not a legal service. It's not something that's good or helpful or ethical. You don't have the free speech to talk about it. There's types of speech that apply to organizations. One's commercial speech, one's <laughs> corporate speech. So commercial speech, obviously, again, like I've told you, I like terms in PR because they're very descriptive. Commercial speech applies to things that are more commercial. You're going to be talking about speeches, brochures, news releases, or promotional vehicles about the organization. But corporate speech is that which comes out of an organization, but they're trying to affect political outcomes. So sometimes organizations will make a statement during a political climate, during certain policies, and say, here is our stand, here's what we think as an organization. So for example, Starbucks recently kind of made a statement, right? That was more corporate speech. They were saying, on this issue, here's where we stand as a company. There's a lot of groups that do that. So you want to identify, because again, under commercial speech, you have certain rules, and under corporate speech, you have certain rules. <coughs> Any questions on these? If you have not read the chapter on PR Law, I strongly encourage you to, because this is a synopsis. This is me trying to weave it together. But if you did not read the background, it's probably very confusing. So for example, one of the ideas with free speech, especially with your generation, is that what you say on Facebook or Twitter <coughs> is yours. Yes, it is your account, but you have consequences from what you put. So employee emails are also public. All of my communications that I sent were read by my boss, every single one. 75% of employees, employers, will monitor what you do during the day on your work computer. And that includes blogs, social media, et cetera. So people have been fired for what they posted on Facebook. People are called into the CEO's office because you spent all day writing your next perfect blog that had nothing to do with your job instead of doing something else. There's some companies that have screen sharing. So your boss can be sitting in their office and flip through to see what every cubicle is looking at. And they will see what you're doing. There are issues of people who are doing things that you guys all know are temptations, and they end up in jail because they did it on company computers. That is the reality of the digital age. What you do is not secret. What you have on social media is not secret, and it's not secure. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But that kind of covers the law section. Again, this is an overview. Law is a big deal in PR because we're dealing with public groups. We're dealing with influencing values, opinions, beliefs, and behaviors. This is the peanut size version. Definitely take the class as you plan to proceed. Digital communications is the next section we want to talk about. This day and age, you will graduate and be expected to understand the digital communication environment. So I wanted to give you an idea about some of the things to keep in mind, some of the things you should look at. A digital communication strategy incorporates everything. My job before coming, to ambas before coming to Biola at Ambassador, and also for some of my clients, is to help them think in a big picture. It's not social media over here and your website over here and things you put out on the line over here. It's one big picture about your brand. It's one message. And your audiences are coming in at different places and different messages are being communicated. So you want to create something holistic that helps your client and your brand and your message. 
And this always starts with conversation management. The biggest thing that I tell brands is they are not joining a conversation. They're, the biggest thing I tell brands, let's take that again, is they are not starting a conversation. They are joining a conversation. People are already talking about the topic. They're already talking about everything under the sun. So when you get online, you're not saying, great, let's start this. You're figuring out where people are, what they're talking, what the tone is, whether they're positive, negative, apathetic. And that comes through conversation management. These are just some of the basic ways you can start listening. Currently.com is one of my favorite. I used to plug that in, especially if I knew my client had something big coming up. If they were going to be in the news or something that day, I would plug in their name and let Currently.com just run all day in a tab. And I'd flip over there every now and then just to make sure no one was freaking out too much about anything. And then if something started to go wrong, I was immediately alerted. I knew who was saying it and who I should go to to talk to about it. So this is an example, an older one. but. Currently, if I typed in Biola University, all these people are talking about Biola. I don't know them, I'm not connected to them, and that's why I like this tool, is it gives me a bigger snapshot than just looking in my own social outlets. And you can see, you can show which ones you want, how fast to go, and where they're showing up. You can go to Twitter. There's advanced searches on Twitter, and there's Twitter search. Now, you don't just want to search your contacts. That's a very small snapshot, especially if you're working for an organization. Search big picture, because a lot's happening on Twitter. So use hashtags, use different topics. And sometimes people say, well, no one's talking about my company. We're brand new. Look for the generic term. Is it exercise? Is it life and leisure? Is it reading? Is it education? Is it automotive? Is it entertainment? The topic is being talked about, and you want to find that. Google alerts are also really helpful. If you have a client or you're working for an organization, you should already have this. It kind of gives you the summary at the end of every day about what's been said that Google found, which is helpful because Google's huge. They pretty much own the web. But also because it's all in one spot. Some people get it to come to them every hour. I didn't have any clients that were quite that intense. So I did, I think, daily just to make sure, like, hey, did anyone write a blog anywhere that addressed this? Did anything come up in any of the outlets? And you can kind of suggest how often you want it, what types, whether you want high priority, everything, whatever, the volume, and where you want it sent to. <coughs> QR codes are pretty common now. There's been a couple classes where people haven't known what a QR code is, but I think that's changing. And some people are wondering if we're kind of on the tail end of QR codes, if they're kind of phasing out. But, oh, there's no picture. How many of you know what a QR code is? OK, a QR code, it looks almost like a barcode. And it's on different products. And you scan it with your iPhone or any sort of thing that has an app that connects. And it will take you to a location online. So one of the things I encourage a lot of students to do when they come see me with their resumes is create a QR code and put it on your resume in the bottom so it can go to your LinkedIn or it can go to your website because it's an automatic tie-in. But as a PR professional, you need to think about, how do I use a QR code for my clients? So some people put it on business cards, and it will automatically take you to the website. Some people have coupons at the QR code. So you're handing out information like on a brochure, and you're saying, hey, and just use this QR code, you'd get a free coupon, that sort of thing. So you measure who's coming. It takes them straight to a place. You don't have to use one of those really funky links. It's just an easy way to go from print to digital very seamlessly. SEO is also very significant. And it's my passion because I see it as a huge puzzle. I love SEO. SEO also drives some people up the wall. And it's always changing. There's no rules that cannot be broken, apparently, in SEO. So SEO is search engine optimization. And it's the goal of figuring out, when I go to Google and I type in best places to eat in Orange County, who comes up first? Which place is going to be listed? And if I represent places that have restaurants in Orange County, I want to understand how to get them to the top. That search engine optimization is figuring out how to optimize your company to show in results. And the reason why SEO is growing and growing in importance, a couple years ago, people were still debating whether PR people needed to know about SEO. I've always been just such a firm advocate that you must know about it, because it impacts how you write social media content, tent, how you put information on the website, the kind of things you are going to put out in a press release, all of that influences SEO. And if you don't understand SEO, then you could have great content, and you're still not going to show up as a great place to eat on Friday nights in Orange County, but you could be a great organization. 
So SEO is that ability. You kind of touch on it, and it deals with keywords and concepts that people are looking to. This is an old map, very old. But basically, there's some big players. Google, biggest search engine there is. Who knows the biggest competitor for Google right now? Bing. Yeah, Bing. They're doing this full out like attack on Google, which I find very humorous, where they're showing people like on the street, like pick which one's the best. Oh, you picked Bing, you won. That sort of idea. <laughs> and it's to show you like, hey, Bing is a better result for what you want. Search engines have one thing they do. Their gold, what they value, is being able to give you the answer for what you're looking for. So both Bing and Google are saying, we're your best option. Yahoo, really not a big player as much anymore. But then there's a whole bunch of other sites, like Ask Jeeves, Ask.com. I don't even know if all of these are still up. Some of them, you can pay to have your page come up. And other ones, you can earn to have your page come up. Paid is pay per click, PPC. Earned is SEO, search engine optimization. So sometimes people will say, I can do SEO. Give me $500, I'll have you on the front page tomorrow. That is not SEO, that's something else. Either it's bad SEO or it's PPC. So here's an example of Christmas party, because I love Christmas. This is what came up, and you can see that my keywords are bold. So Google's saying, what you looked for shows up here. This is why we think this is a good result. It's in titles, it's in descriptions. And there's a whole bunch, <laughs> there's a lot of nuances to this. If this sort of thing interests you, take the class on SEO and social media and digital analysis, because we'll go more into it. It would be impossible to all cover in one day, but it's worthwhile knowing about. <coughs> but beyond this, you also need to think through, where are people going? Because again, we are talking about public relations, not just online information. So your concern always should be, how is this affecting the public? How are they experiencing something? And that's why you start looking at where are people going and how do they use those links. I use Bitly as my link shortener just because it can tell me when I post something on Twitter, how many people actually click on it or how many people follow through without having to do too many more metrics. So this is Bitly and it's fairly simple. You paste in the URL of where you want to send them to, and it makes it nice and short so you can use it on Twitter or on Facebook or on other locations. And then if I wanted to, it would give me how many people clicked on it, and I think where they are depends the different levels of sign-in that you have. The essence of what you're looking at kind of starts tying into social media in this fact that digital communications is a relationship. It is interacting with the public in a new sphere. It used to be that communications was largely push. So it was, we are going to send you information. It will be in your newspaper, it will be on your radio, it will be on the TV, and we are going to tell you everything. But now it's very interactive, and people pull the information they want. They will go to the website that they want to go to, they will download the files they want to download, they will like the organizations that they want to like, they will follow the ones they want to follow. It's no longer you getting to dictate what all goes out. It's a two-way thing. And that's been a hard transition for a lot of organizations because it changes the game. Everything's different when it has to be totally relational. You have to provide value to people on social media. You can't just put out information. So most of you probably at one point or another followed a group on Twitter or on Facebook that is so boring. They pretty much spam you all day. They just send out information after information. Anyone been there? You guys are better at choosing apparently than I am. I've been there numerous times and I usually end up unfollowing or unliking them because I just get annoyed. If they're my friend, then I just hide them. But <laughs> either way, their messages no longer reach me. That's what I ensure happened. There are other groups that give great information and it's not just about them. It's much broader and I'm like, that's interesting. I want to share that because I feel like that was so smart or that's interesting because it relates to my stage of life or that helps me live better because it simplifies how I'm gonna set up my kitchen, whatever, they give me something that's useful. I'm no longer annoyed. So as an organization, you have to ask yourself, especially on social media, what kind of stuff can you put out that's valuable to the people you're interacting with? And that is not saying we are a great brand, it's not saying come buy our tickets for $54, it's not sales. It should be about relationship. If you are sitting down having coffee with a person, would you be saying what you're putting on social media? 
that's kind of a good question to ask yourself. Is it relational? Apparently, this doesn't want to go. There we go. So you want to optimize your social efforts. So you should remember what social media is all about. Social media, being social, interacting. People like to interact with brands. There's something about 70% of brands, I think is the latest statistic, do not respond to people on their social outlets. It's not even just criticism, and it's not people saying, I had a rotten experience with you and the brand ignoring them, which is also a bad idea. But it's people who say, we love you. We can't get enough of this product. Brands just never respond. It's just silence. That's not social. That shows that they have a push mentality. Their idea is they put out the material and then they're done. So that creates, obviously, a negative environment within social media. You also have to write for the platform. I know I'm kind of a social media nerd, so probably not everyone is like this, but it drives me nuts when I see things that are linked. And it's the same on the blog and on Facebook and on Twitter. And it's like truncated. You can't even read it when you're on the platform. I'm not going to leave Twitter to find out what you posted on Facebook, which is still too short to go to your blog. Just make it for the platform. And the people who write for Twitter have a different sound, a different tone than the people who write for Facebook or the way you write. And it's a different way you write for a blog. And if it's a different way you, even for Pinterest, there's some writing involved, not a lot. Every platform is different. How do you write a description for a YouTube video? And how is that going to be different than something you post on Facebook? Those are important questions to ask. And it kind of ties into something I strongly encourage, don't mechanize your communication. Because social media is social, it's about the people. It's about the interactive. So when you link those all together, it doesn't look like you really want to be social. It looks like you're checking off a box of, hey, we got this up on the social outlet today. Good job, us. If that is your capacity, if there's not enough time, pick one social outlet to do well instead of five that you're kind of succeeding at. And engage your audience to have a voice. Start conversations. Give people the opportunity to talk and respond back. Give them call outs. There's all sorts of ways brands do this. They have like Follow Friday. Some people highlight different fans and make them the like cover image for a while. There's different ways you can engage your audience, but you really want to. Because again, social media is about social. If you're not, if there's not that two way, you're not effectively using social media. So it's often a key component of PR campaigns. Because we're trying to reach the public, and because the media reaches the public in a mass way, we like to work with media communications. We like to get our client into the LA Times, or interviewed on a major talk show, or somehow covered in a magazine, because that reaches a lot of people. And people tend to be connected to different outlets. So if there is someone you really like to listen to on the radio, or you really love it when this magazine comes in, or you are a diehard fan of a certain paper, if they cover a topic, you're more likely to listen to it than if it had come out of a different medium. So when you identify the segment of the population you're trying to reach and the best publication to reach them, you kind of can zero in on which journalists you want to get to know, which cultivating relationships you want to make happen. It's a specific genre of PR. People explain it in different ways. Some groups have media relations separated from PR because they see it as PR more community and media relations as a different function. If you talk to Disney, it's in a separate section. Essentially what you should understand is that PR people who work within media relations are working to develop relationships with journalists and get coverage of a topic within the media. So whatever sphere that falls into, that's a part of PR. And ideally, in our program, you're really equipped for it because you're coming out of a journalism and integrated media. You understand a reporter's mindset. Therefore, you're better able to craft a story that meets what they need. The last thing reporters want is a bunch of fluff that's just free advertising. They're not going to cover it. But if you can actually be helpful, if you can be beneficial in what you're providing, you're likely going to be excellent at media relations. So you work to engage the media, and that comes through knowing journalists, and you would learn more about this in the media relations class. There are a lot of tools that you can use within media relations. One is a press release. We've talked about that and how we can do it in one way for offline and another way online, but they basically have the same components. We're going to talk today about all of these other areas, smart news releases, photos, media kits, media alerts, and fact sheets. Those are things you'll become more familiar with if you continue on within public relations. But I just want to introduce you to those terms, make sure you understand what they mean and how they're used. So all of these six are going to be covered. So don't worry if you miss it. We're just going through categories. A news release, 
we've talked about earlier. It actually began with Ivy Lee. You guys remember Ivy Lee, right? Yeah. Semi? Okay, good. He's from, you know, earlier in the semester. He worked with the Pennsylvania Railroads. That was a big thing. He also was with the Rockefellers. And he used a press release in 1906. That's where we kind of trace the first start of this idea of press releases, too. And it's commonly used, oh, while it is the most commonly used, the way we use it with digital communication has changed. Ah, OK. Just so I can interpret what I put on your slide for you here. Sorry about that. Press releases are used a lot in PR. There's this conversation, and you'll see it in PR circles, is the press release dead? The press release is by no means dead. How we do press releases, how we send them to people, how we make them work is drastically different than it used to be. So it's taken a new form, but it's not dead. Between 55% and 97%, that's a huge percentage, are thrown out. They're just not used, depending on the publication you send it to, how many they get a day, what kind of coverage they can do. What this percentage should tell you is that it's very competitive. To be good at media relations, you really have to understand how to message something, how to angle it, and how to write in a strong way. So on average, people can receive 2,000 a day. It's different if you are a mommy blogger. I know some of them receive like 100 a day. Others receive thousands a day. People who are producers at shows receive different amounts. It depends on the show, the outlet, the coverage, the market. But they receive a lot, and they don't take a lot. They take a very little. This should look so familiar to you, you should recognize it right off the bat. This is just a basic press release. And that's what a lot of people talk about. Is the press release still there? So a lot of times, if you are kind of in an old school area, maybe you go to work for a company, and they don't have a lot of young leadership, they will equate press releases and writing for the media with public relations. They think that is synonymous. The thing is, PR is much bigger. It encompasses much more. So you want to understand when you're applying for jobs, are you applying for media relations? Do they think that all you're going to do is write press releases, or are they thinking bigger picture? So we're familiar with that. You guys had that from previous times. But here's some tips. The headline is vital. We talked about that. If your headline is boring, people aren't going to read it. They're not going to continue. There's too much competition. You need to keep it short. I recommend shorter than 200 words and no more than one page. Some people try to go on, and especially in the digital era, there's no end to a page, but people don't like scrolling and scrolling. You can use bullet points. That can help you give some key facts really quickly. I recommend always putting it in the body of the email. I've been to numerous times where reporters say, you know what, if you send it to me as an attachment, I will delete it. I don't open attachments on my smartphone, or if I don't know you, I'm not going to download something that could wreck my computer. So unless you have a really strong relationship, the reporter doesn't want to take the time to open the attachment. Therefore, you lose your shot, even if it was an amazing press release. We talked about the difference. A written press release is double spaced, so you're rarely going to send those anymore. And an electronic one is single spaced. To succeed, you need to have correct style. You need to understand what AP style is, because reporters expect to see it in that format, and you are under high pressure to get it right, so make sure. Also, ensure that it's news. If you're sending it to a news person, they want to make sure that their readers would care. They don't want to cover something from last month. They want to cover something that's actually interesting today that no one else has covered. You also need to understand how wording impacts things. You can say things in multiple ways, and it carries different connotations. So once you get into media relations, you really start to pick apart words. You start to think, what's the worst way this could be used? So when you're writing a headline, ask yourself, if I knew nothing about this, what would I think? When you're reading a sentence, think, does this sound like the values of my company, or does it sound like we don't care about the public? Those are all questions that you learn to ask and answer within media relations. What do you guys think of this? What's some reactions? Here's a press release. They're a little old, but still press release. Yeah. The headline is really boring. Yeah, the headline is awful. A unique new business. What news is that? There's new businesses all the time. And is it really unique? Because unique is one of a kind. Is there really no other business on the face of the planet that is like this? Anything else? Yeah, bothers me too. It should be. Everyone should be capitalized. It's true. Good catch. 
Nitpicky is really good in media relations because one thing gets it thrown out. That's good. Yeah. Is it not good because it doesn't tell you like any big news about either? Yeah. Or like which any business? Yeah, I have no interest in that because I don't even know what I'm getting into when I read that. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they really lost it on that lead. That doesn't draw you in. Good. Anna. Um, they say they're United States of America, which is kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to put the country in. That is very true. Once you name the city, if the city's not well known, the state. Then you're done. Good. All right. Here's another one. These are real press releases that I pulled off the web. What do you guys think of this? Yeah. The headline is very unprofessional. Yeah. <coughs> headline is, why is it unprofessional? Because it uses slang, like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, We're amazing. It's so unnecessary. Yeah. One of the things in AP style, too, is not to sound opinionated. You're not telling the world you're amazing. You're letting people draw their, wow, that's kind of an opinion. It's <coughs> unnecessary. Yeah. Um, it's really wordy. Yeah. Very wordy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's also sales. Very sales. Yes, Morgan. Well, just in that first, like, bolded sentence, it says, has been around. Mm-hmm. Like, because it's around. Yeah. This is amazing and should be an indication of how many people are in media relations and why it's so few that get taken. There are a lot of people who write poorly. If you can write well, if you can identify what is good and make a statement that's strong, you're going to do well, because these are real press releases. Somebody wrote this, was paid to write it, and put it out. What about this? There's no news value about planning to do something, right? Especially planning to utilize a social media platform that's well utilized across the face of the planet. That's not, a reporter's probably not going to pick that up and say, wow, this is the story I want on the front page tomorrow. That's amazing. Right? Any other things? Yeah. Um, what is BDD? BDD, exactly. It's a little confusing unless you're on the insider. As a media relations person, you never want to presume someone knows your acronyms. Good. All right. Oh, we have one more. <laughs> yeah, I really liked this one. This is going to the media, by the way. So you send a press release to the media, and the headline kind of insults the media. Uh huh. It's really long. It forgets a date as well. All right. So those are some examples of press releases, what not to do. But remember when I said press releases have changed? What we've really moved into is what we call smart releases. And people still refer to them as press releases excuse me, press releases, but they're a smart release. And that's when you have a news release, and it's digital, but it also includes video or photos, graphics, audio, social bookmarking, networking, hyperlinks, SEO. When all of that comes together in a convergent way, you have created a smart release. And it's much better for media relations. It's more helpful for journalists. It's more dynamic. You can pack more in a smaller space, but still have a ton that you've covered. So a smart release may be, and you've seen it, you have a headline, but then you have a video in the corner that someone can click on and play. When you reference something like the company's name, you hyperlink it to the home page. At the bottom, you have things like share this, and you have all the networks you could do it on. You use different strategies for SEO. So if someone's searching about it, they find your press release. Maybe you have a video file, and you could have download video here or logo available here. Because if a journalist is going to use it, they want all of that information. Media outlets now, they have Facebook, they have Twitter, they have a website, they have their media outlet too. So whether they are talking on air or in print, they can use all of that material online as well. So some things about publicity photos, some things that are some errors that people sometimes make when they first get into it. Publicity photos need to be high res and appealing to the media. You can't just take a few shots from your camera and throw it on there and say, here's for the media. You want to have high quality. 
you want to think through the basic things that you learn in the photography classes. Is it zeroed in on the subject? Does it kind of have an interesting angle? There are so many photos taken in the world right now that you do not want to give the media a stupid photo. Or not stupid, we shouldn't say that, should we? Okay, a photo that it does not follow these rules and that anyone else can take. You want your photos to be sharp. So you can look at scaling, you can look at angles, you can look at anything that you can do to make it look great. I had one client photo and they did not send me this kind of photo. It was probably the worst personal profile picture I've ever seen. He looked out of shape, he looked like he was 50, he, it was horrible and he was like in very casual clothes and we were marketing him as this young hip guy who was like coming in as the top of an organization. It was horrible. So I had to go to him. I had to be the one to say, you know what, we're just not going to use this photo. Here's why. Let me explain the impression it would give if this comes out of you in the media. And let me tell you the kind of photo I envision. I envision you in a suit. I envision you shaving before we take the photo. Those kind of things in a nice way just because they don't always think about what the media will see with a photo. That's your job. You're the PR person. You're looking at their brand. They're doing their amazing work and you're helping expand that by recognizing the downfalls that a bad photo can do. A media kit then kind of is the next step, right? So we have a press release. That's like one little thing. We turn a press release into a smart release and it becomes much more dynamic. But you can make a media kit and this is huge. Media kits are kind of the all-in-one stop for a journalist. They have everything. So you could have your basic news release, you could have a news feature, a pre-written article that they could use. You could have a fact sheet, you want to have your photos, high-res photos, easy to download, bios of everyone involved, maybe your CEO or the board, a basic brochure, definitely your contact information. You can get these hard copy, you can get them mailed to you, some organizations. A lot have just put it online now because all of these are easy to download and you just compress the file. So here's Starbucks. This is their newsroom, which is your online presence, and they have their media kit. You can see that across the top, they have a lot of the things we just talked about. They have their about, which would be an FAQ. They have news, which are the press releases they've recently sent out. They have multimedia, which they would consider the videos or the pictures that you could download. They have the biographies, they have contacts, and they have speaking requests. All of it at one spot. If you don't have it and the journalist has to chase it, they're too busy. They're going to go to someone who has put it in one spot, who makes it easy for them. Fact sheets and media alerts. I keep talking about those things and I want to kind of clarify. So a media alert is basically alerting the media. Again, I love PR terms. And it's the five W's of an H of an event that you're hoping the media will cover. You're alerting the media that something big is happening and they should show up. It might be an announcement. So Facebook has done that, Apple does that. When they make a big announcement, they'll send media alerts to the media. But then you have fact sheets and there's two kinds. You can have a corporate profile, which is all this information about the company. <coughs> Pardon me. It's a background on the company. It's what they do, it's their vision. But you can also do one page basic fact sheets and there's so many things you can cover with that. You can cover a basic thing about a product. So if you're doing a media kit around a specific thing you're launching, do a fact sheet on that. You can do a fact sheet on certain initiatives, a fact sheet on ways the company is partnering with nonprofits. Anything that you think, hey, the media could really use this information. It might be that thing that gives them a little different of an angle that they will then use to cover it. That could go in a fact sheet. So we have press releases. We have smart releases, we have photos, we have a media kit, we have, those include media alerts, you have fact sheets, and then you engage the media. You can have the most amazing things and still not get coverage because you've never actually built relationships. Online newsrooms are key. So many of the clients I work with, I consult and I explain to them, this is how you get an online newsroom. This is what should be included. You also have pitching. Pitching to the media is when you call them or you email them or you see them face to face and you present them with the idea of your story. You say, here's what's going on, here's why I think it's a great fit for you. In media relations, you're going to learn the techniques of pitching, but really you do not want to pitch to people you don't know. You want relationships. No one likes to feel used, no one likes to be used. 
this should be a mutually beneficial relationship between you and the reporter. So you get to know them, you get to know what they need, their deadlines, and then you pitch stories. You can do media tours where you travel the country and you stop off at different places and you do interviews. You could do press parties. So before a big event, a press only section is there and they can get interviews with key people. So maybe at like a red carpet event, then you're gonna have actors and directors and producers available at this press party for key facts and then the stories start running during your event. You can do news conferences. Those are typically when something bad's happened. You see that a lot during a crisis. And you can do interviews with specific outlets. Those are all ways that you can engage with the media. You've created great client, you have a great client, you've created great content, then you engage the media. There are specific ways you engage the media with writing for the radio and writing for TV. So we're gonna look at it briefly. When you do radio, instead of a news release or a press release, we call it an audio news release because it's audio, it's for the radio. You're looking at between 30 and 60 seconds and you are then writing for the ear. The way you write for the ear is very different than how you write for someone to read. You have to think about how someone listens, what it sounds like when you start off a sentence with a prepositional phrase, how to draw someone in without losing them but not giving the information because people take a while to tune in. So you want them to tune in and then list your important information. PSAs are for the public service announcements. Announcements, they're free. They're basically nonprofits. So you can't have IBM wanting to do a PSA, right? Because they're for profit. They would do an audio news release. But maybe the Special Olympics of Southern California would ask you to write a PSA and see if any stations would carry that. TV, we do video news releases. Again, love PR. You definitely know which medium you're writing for and what it is. It's about 90 seconds and it can cost anywhere from $20,000 to $50,000. I've never had a client that could afford that, so I haven't gotten to work with a VNR, which is a video news release. I've done ANRs, audio news releases, and I've done news releases, just the written kind. You include news reports, B-roll, a clear ID. You cannot send a video news release and make it look like it's just the radio or the TV station. You have to identify that it is a news release that you're sending, that you're an organization creating it. You create script and information, you make contacts, you send them extra sound bites because they will probably repurpose it if they do use it for their own newscast. We're gonna, yeah, go ahead. I am going to show you one. Okay. That will probably answer then. It might not. I'll ask after, see if it does. We've all done it. Found the perfect guest, got <coughs> it, and then three weeks later, there it is in the Sunday paper, selling for less. Or worse, maybe we waited too long to buy what that special someone wanted, hoping it would go on sale, and instead, it sold out. Walmart's Christmas price guarantee promises to solve both of those problems. We make it easy for our customers. If a customer finds a lower advertised price on any gift they bought at Walmart, they can bring in that receipt, bring in that current ad, and we will actually give them the difference on a Walmart gift card. Walmart's Christmas price guarantee applies to items purchased in the eight weeks leading up to Christmas and then featured in a competitor's current holiday ad. It even applies to layaway. However, it won't apply to internet ads or Black Friday. Reporting from Walmart, I'm All right, so we're going to critique this. What was starting off good about this based on what you know about news releases in general, media relationships, and what you need to do in a VNR? Yes? It was very relatable. Mm-hmm. Very relatable. They had a good angle, what they were going for. Good. They had a lot of facts, right? You got the information, you knew the details. As a reporter, if I were watching that, I would say, could I now create my own stand-up? Could I do my own voiceover with the details, pulling out their video, but using my voice? Because on a news station that's televised and broadcast, people are connected to the anchors. They want to hear from the anchor, not from Walmart. So could I do that with the information I have? I could. Yes? It was very compact. Exactly, they went straight to it. They knew that you have a limited time span and that if you get on the news, you're gonna have a short window. Good, yes. Um, their visuals were really good. Like when it wasn't showing the spokesperson, it had like common people just like all of us, you know, and so it was really 
Yeah, great shots of the video and ways to use it. What would you, imp oh, go ahead. It was produced by Walmart as a VNR to send to reporters. Oh, okay. And so hopefully their goal is that a news station picks it up and runs something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a press release in video form. What would you do differently? Yeah. The fact that their, um, their spokeswoman was like, it, she didn't say much. She said like what she was supposed to, but she could have been a little more engaging with her voice and her face. Yeah. Good. So like the on-camera visual. Yes. Um, when they were interviewing the ladies from Walmart, they had this blue screen in the background, and they were super distracting. Yeah. Like yeah, so location of the person. Good. I would have made it a bigger angle. I doubt that people are going to pick up on that and say, let's run a story on Walmart. What they might run a story on is how consumers can save during the holidays. So instead of having so many of the sound bites specifically say just Walmart, a better strategy is to include something that could be more universal but still get Walmart in there. So if you had the same conversation but the interview was from someone at Walmart, your, your client, your brand is still in the news, but you're more likely to be picked up. Okay, so there's more. You could do guest appearances or product placement. How many of you have watched a movie with an Apple Mac in it? Anyone? Yeah. They're so good at product placement. Or, okay, you're going to notice that I've been in a PhD and apparently under a rock. There's a movie, and they have Mini Coopers, and they go steal stuff, and there's four of them like yeah. driving. Yeah. That movie was great product placement for Mini Coopers, right? Mm -hmm. They got a lot of sales. So product placement is really great. If you can get a spokesperson to make an appearance on a talk show or even a sitcom or something that's regular every week and somehow they're in the background or something, that's great. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.